Nick Comfrey, thank you so much for joining me today. Super excited to chat with you. And Nick, you are the CEO and co-founder of Seam. Seam is the social layer for Web3 Gaming and is a new platform to code, design, and curate your perfect social features. So before you know, diving deep into that, I'd love to hear a little bit about your background. I understand that you know you spent some time at Facebook slash Meta. I would love to hear all about that. Yeah, thanks, Andrew, for having me. Thanks for the introduction as well. Yes, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Seam, thinking about sort of how Web3 can build a better, more ethical social network system. And of course, a lot of those views were derived from my time at Meta. So while I was there, I was on the groups team in 2016, thinking about how people can sort of build and share within these communities. I then joined the um, sort of sharing side of things and built out uh, music for Facebook stories and grew that from zero to millions of people, which was very exciting because I just love building tools that help people express themselves. Like adding a soundtrack to your mood for your story was definitely something that I was really interested in. And then I sort of wrapped up my career there at the new product experiences team. And they were thinking about how do you build the next Instagram? Like what is the next frontier for social? Um, so I had some fun there during the pandemic. We built Collab, which was a collaborating with musicians and adding these little clips. But I think I started to get a little bit disillusioned at that time because I realized like the way that Facebook's monetization and sort of ad-driven revenue model was sort of a constraint that all existing, you know, incumbent Web2 social media was sort of, you know, limited against. And so when I looked at my future internally, trying to build the next big social app within their innovation arm, I thought, you know, I don't really think this is going to be the next big thing. And that's basically when I met my co-founder. Her name is Katie Atherholt, and she went, sort of had the roots deep in the DAO ecosystem. And so through that, sort of, I went into that Web3 building collaboratively from the bottom up. And I started to wonder, like, what if we could hand over the keys to the castle here? And instead of me being an engineer in Silicon Valley deciding, like, what the next social platform looks like, what if we could actually allow people to sort of like rip and remix and start to customize these social experiences for themselves? So that was like the genesis idea of Seam. And, you know, we take many different forms. We're the gaming layer for Web3. We sometimes like to call ourselves crypto MySpace because we just love the old era of Tumblr, of MySpace, about being able to get in there and really have customization inspired by other people. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is bring it back to a more collaborative and, yeah, fun era of the internet, especially when it comes to meeting people online. Awesome. Okay. So take me back to when you were at Facebook, what do you think Facebook was doing well? And what do you think that they were doing poorly in terms of social broadly? Yeah. So I still, I still really identify with the mission, right. To bring the world closer together and can like have, and especially I saw the best of it when I was on the Facebook groups, because those are like everything under the sun from support groups for parents who have kids that have challenges to you know, buy nothing groups, which is like sharing and giving to other people in your community. That's like the most wholesome side of the internet, really. I think the limiting factor there was what I alluded to earlier, which is this business model, where, you know, Facebook, obviously, they sell ads, right. And so in order to make that a profitable endeavor, they then have to figure out how to gather data on you because targeted advertisements do much better than untargeted advertisements. Like if I, as an iOS developer, want to sell some ads on my little app, I probably get a couple of pennies per user. Um, but Facebook's avenue, um, average revenue per user um, in average is like $35. And so that's like orders of magnitude more than what you can get if you don't target the ads. So then you sort of have this misalignment of incentives between the platform and the user, where the platform wants the users to stay there longer, they want them scrolling on the newsfeed. You know, you sort of have the doom scrolling scenario where people are just sort of like clickbait. You know, that's sort of what, unfortunately, the business model incentivizes. And so there's this internal tension where I think most of the people who I worked with when I was there really wanted to bring the world closer together and have people share. But then you had the ads business model that sort of like was constantly at tension. And so when you have that sort of tension internally, you know, there's just that incentive misalignment, which makes it hard to sort of always act on the right thing for users. I mean, isn't that kind of a, a bigger issue with the business model of the internet? Or isn't that kind of the business model of the internet is kind of uh, ad driven? And 
And, you know, if it's ad driven, then essentially it's outrage driven because outrage drive, drives the most engagement. And so like, that's kind of how things are. And, and do you think that that's going to change? Yeah, I actually do. And that's sort of the business model behind Seam as well. Because all of these ad-based platforms, I mean, you can basically look from the low end, Reddit is like 49 cents per user, and then TikTok is like, you know, $46 per user. That's sort of like the range of ad-based platforms. And you're right, because that's sort of been like the Web2 predominant business model. But then I think Web3 is really where I start to get excited about flipping the script and changing the way that people sort of pay for these kinds of platforms. Because the most analogous thing that you can look at, in my opinion, is gaming. Because I really love the idea of this sort of like free to play game where most people, you know, log onto their game, they play it, they don't actually have to end up paying anything for it. Um, but where the money comes in is the customizations. It's people who really enjoy the game. It's people who want to, you know, express themselves in different kinds of ways, whether that's skins or items or all of these kinds of things. And so then you look at Fortnite, right? And Fortnite, the average revenue per user at Fortnite is actually over $100 at this point. It's crazy. Individual skins, like they have a collab with NFL. An individual collab with the NFL brought in $50 million just for that skin. And then you start to look at it. It's like, okay, those are good numbers. Those are better than advertising even. But then, you know, show me the incentive, right? I love the quote, um, Charlie Munger. It's like, if you show me the incentive, I will show you the outcome. And so let's, you know, play that thought experiment. Like what if, you know, what if Web3 Social had this sort of like play to earn or, you know, customization business model, like, what would that look like? Well, in my opinion, I think that would be a lot more incentive aligned, because then you have to have a platform where people are showing up for the intrinsic value, right? Because they want to be there, and they care enough about it such that they're sort of purchasing these things, whether there's their cosmetics, or in the scene universe, they're called blocks, where they're like little mini apps that help you, you know, have fun with your friends. You know, that to me seems a lot more incentive aligned because you don't even have to be there for hours a day. You don't have to be doom scrolling. You just have to be invested enough in the platform that you're willing to, you know, customize it or add extra functionality. And if you're a business, even, you know, you don't have to go into the DAO world to just know that if you're a business page, for example, you probably want to match your brand colors and you would probably want to have a little extra functionality. So paying a little bit for that doesn't, wouldn't actually be too bad. And not having the outrage-driven business model seems like a win-win. So I think the Web3 internet is going to be more lucrative for individual platforms that do well and also more incentive-aligned with their users. You were at Facebook at slash Meta, and, and you were there and you know really really into social, and you liked it, but you're thinking about, okay, how can I improve this, and how can we make the kind of the, the world better, essentially? And so you, you came up with Seam. First of all, how do you describe Seam to people that are not in Web3, like not really tech-savvy? Like, if I was explaining Seam to my grandma, like how, what, what would I say? Well, funny you mention that, because I do have to explain Seam to my grandma, especially, you know, going back for Easter and all of that. Yeah. So I really think of it as a more ethical social platform. And whether that's focused on, we don't need to sell ads because we have other ways to make money, or you can also go sort of the MySpace route, where it's going to be a really fun way because you can actually start to customize the profiles again. You can make things sort of more expressive and line up with what you care about, um, whether that's from the individual look and feel of the pages or the actual kind of functionality in these social spaces. So Ad-free social media is one way we like to say it. Sort of a return to the MySpace era of the internet is another way if people are sort of love the era where you put your anthem on your profile and you have your favorite song. And it's also kind of fun that we get to, you know, stitch the internet together. We are seeing after all, where we get to break down these walled gardens and sort of have all of these different experiences live on one page. So whether that's you care about Twitter, so you want your Twitter feed on your scene profile, sure, put a block for that you want to like have your favorite Spotify block, yeah, embed that right there. So in a, in a way, we can sort of stitch the internet together from all of the stuff that exists too. So there's a lot of different angles that are just fun, even if you're not into the underlying, you know, Web3 technology. Very cool. So talking about the underlying Web3 technology, the thought process is, okay, business model of the internet kind of messed up with, with you know, be, being ad driven. We can change that with Web3. And you were mentioning some really crazy stats around Fortnite, how you say you said it was the average customer is, is spending over a hundred dollars. It was that per year or throughout their life, throughout the average customer lifetime. That was per year as of 2020, I believe the stat was, um, cause they don't have to like Epic games doesn't report like, you know, quarterly earnings or anything like that. So it's a little bit back of the napkin. Very cool. So, and is the thought process, okay, people are going to 
purchase, you know, NFTs slash skins or kind of um, things that showcase their personality essentially, or tell a story about who they are and what they stand for? In so many words, yes. I think the cool thing though, is that rather than sort of being this web two platform where Fortnite decides, you know, these are the skins that we're going to offer. What we like to do is open that up to user generated content. So these themes eventually will be something that, you know, you can create and then someone else can sort of take that and we get to become this marketplace, which ultimately, I mean, one of the other things I learned about Facebook is like user generated content is just so much more fun and it scales so much faster and has all of these network effects and all these amazing things from a business perspective. But from a user perspective, that's also just really nice because if you create something, then I can be inspired from it and I can remix it. And then from the sort of like underlying technological side, I think NFTs sort of have this interesting property that we don't talk about very much, which is, you know, who created the NFT? It's not necessarily who owns the NFT, but it's also, you know, an indelible, unchangeable mark that you created something. So I think the creative attribution side of sort of the NFT creation part of it is something that we can leverage for creating these really interesting chains of like revenue and creative attribution. So then we can like truly sort of remix the internet in that way. That's so cool. Okay. So, so if I go on a seam, I can design my own seam page, which is kind of like a profile, right? So I can mm -hmm. use it, plug in my Twitter, can I do like Spotify and stuff. Like, yeah, I mean, you can see it if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you want to share screens, that'd be, that'd be awesome. Okay, cool. So this is my seam profile. It's supposed to be zany. It's supposed to be really fun. You can see that I've got my favorite DJ sets over here. You've got my, I'm listening to a lot of funk recently, which is a pretty wild <laughs> new genre, but this is my Spotify playlist. That's you've awesome. got, you know, my friends over here. You've got all of my different kinds of NFTs. These are some farmlands that I'm pretty proud of. Um, and yeah, so then each one of these profiles can like look very, very different depending on the kind of personality behind, um, you know, who's here. So we've got, different kinds of NFTs, obviously. Um, Sydney really likes her, her pudgy penguins, her Pokemon cards, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but then the real fun is when you sort of get to like drag and drop and remix um, all of this kind of stuff. You know, these are um, community built blocks. So someone in our community actually came in and built this as a pixel art block. And so you can sort oh, of like drag cool. and drop um, all of that kind of stuff because we have an open source SDK. So all of these blocks, all of the source code for this is open source. Wow. Um, so each one of these in here, you know, oh, we're okay, wait, hold on. assembling you, 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 this library. This? So, so, yes. we have, so, so, so this is the block page where, mm -hmm. so each one of these is a block and what we got, we got profile header, text, website, video, image, link, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. We, we have a whole bunch of, yeah. so, so exactly. these are blocks made so, by you guys or by the community? Yes. So most of them are made by us at this point, but these bottom two or the refreshing GIF was a remix. So we had the Giphy block, which just sort of allows you to go in here and then, oh, it's St. Patrick's Day. So I mean, there's going to be like some St. Patrick's Day GIF, of course. Um, but then someone took that code, remixed it, and then published it as a new block, which is a refreshing GIF block. So this one, I don't know, like say we want sort of a cat GIF or something like that. It'll just choose a random cat GIF for us. And then if I publish this, uh, it will then refresh and be just a totally random um, cat. Well, that's a weird oh. cat. So you got to be careful, you know, user generated stuff. Yeah. It's going to be all over the place. Um, but the fun thing, right, is that someone came in, took a block that existed, remix it to be something that they were interested in. They wanted it to be a little bit more alive, a little bit more zany on their profile um, and made a new block out of it. And then the pixel art block, as I was mentioning, was a complete fan creation. So they went in, used their SDK and built a new block from scratch. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can do in here. Obviously you can put in your Twitter profile if you want. I'm Nick Confrey on Twitter. And so this will just embed the, your entire Twitter you know, once it, once it loads there. Um, so you can start to see that you can stitch the internet together wow. from other pieces of social that do exist. You know, we're hoping that we can break down some of these barriers. That's so cool. It's, it's like, there's not a good analogy that, you know, of course it's part social media, but it's so much more than that. It's, and I can't think of a, think of a great analogy to the kind of the, the blocks like uh, that to me seems pretty yeah. different than, than many other things that I've seen. Is there an analogy that you use to, you know, tell people, well, it's kind of like this. Well, it's kind of like Notion blocks. And in mm. fact, we took the terminology from Notion, where if you embed different things within there, um, you know, they're calling them blocks. But in order to have them be 
you know, open source and remixable. Uh, that is something, you know, Replit maybe also comes to mind because they sort of have these online source code editors that you can go in and you can start to edit things. But again, I think the mix of blocks plus social media plus Web3 is something that only Seam can sort of bring out into the world. Have you seen any unusual or like interesting user behaviors that you're like, wow, I did, did not realize people, people would do that. Yeah. I mean, so one of the things that I really liked was our EDM weekly card. And so there's a bunch of like EDM artists, electronic artists that put out weekly podcasts, but they're all over the internet, right? You've got some, actually, I can probably just find it right here. Um, EDM weekly. Uh, so each one of these has a handle that you can go to, but each one of these artists, you know, puts it out either on their website or on YouTube or on SoundCloud. You know, Oliver Heldens has his own website. Uh, Don Diablo has his own website. State of Trance is on Spotify. Uh, this guy is only on um, SoundCloud. And so it's like every Monday, all of these release across the entire internet. How do you find them all? Well, one of the good ways to do it is like a scene card, which stitches everything together. So you can, I'm not going to blow out your eardrums right now, but you can listen in line. And so, you know, just having this as your one-stop shop for everything you need to listen to is kind of a fun use case that was emergent and not something that we initially planned for. That's so cool. All right. So, so how does Web3 play a role, role in Seam? In Get everything else. It seems awesome. But how are you implanting Web3? I think two ways. One is an ethos driven alignment. So Web3, you know, has the idea under the hood of interoperability, of composability, and being able to build off of this globally available state database, which is the blockchain. So from that point of view, you know, being able to use these blocks, which can stitch the internet together, ultimately, if we're reading from Twitter, then we're dependent on their API. And their API has already changed on me so many times, especially with the new leadership. So there's something to be said about pulling from the blockchain, whether that's your NFTs or filtering that to specific things that you're interested in, whether that's social tokens or unlocking new themes, depending on what is in your wallet and sort of having that ready built for you when you join from another community, especially gaming communities. That I think is really, really powerful that we sort of have this global database of pieces of your identity that you could be interested in. So there's that part, that part of the blocks. And then there's, I think, the sort of future vision which I was alluding to earlier with the remixable internet, such that the sort of underlying business model is one of a user-generated marketplace, sort of a decentralized app store, where if a business wants to come in and say, hey, I would love for you to build us a block that does, like, say, snapshot voting, or something like that for on-chain kind of stuff, they can put out a bounty for it, someone can complete the block in our SDK, and sort of like start to have these really, really interesting revenue models that you couldn't do in like Web2, for example. And, you know, we're starting to look at things like splitting revenue automatically in smart contracts so that if you create something and then I remix it and then someone else remixes it to me, we actually have this like pretty cool tree of all of the different kinds of ways that this thing has sort of morphed this piece of software in terms of like, do you want your NFTs to look like this or like this or change the size or all that, you know, all ex add extra functionality. And so if someone actually does find that valuable at the very end of the day, and they were like, yeah, I'll, I'll spend some tokens on that or whatever it is, then that ro those royalties can flow back up the chain and sort of everybody can then be compensated for it. And so that like revenue splitting, you know, Web2 is very, I like to say it's very, it's not cooperative, right? Sort of a zero sum game. If you post a YouTube video and it does really well, you get 100% of that ad revenue. And so it's like, what happened to the person who had the idea for that? Or, you know, what happened to the person who created the music for that? Right now, it's like zero sum. You either copyright strike it and it goes down from the internet and that's that. Or, yeah, or the person who created the video, like... That's amazing. Okay. So how do, how do people create on seam? Like, I, I know that, you know, if you're technical, you can go to, you said that there's an SDK and you know, it's open source and people can go there and read the documentation. What about people like myself? Am I able to create things? Yeah. I, I'm not technical at all. Yeah. Well, so there's two answers, one that's possible like right now and one that's possible in the future, starting with the one that's right now. Uh, we're really inspired by things like the Neopets HTML guide. And so this was something that was, you know, Neopets obviously was that web um, game that you have these little pets and it was popular in the early 2000s with kids, um, but you could customize your store. And the way that you would do that is by using custom HTML. 
And in order to facilitate that, they put out this HTML guide, which was uh, like aimed at kids from ages eight to 10, basically. Uh, and it was like, this is how you change the background color. This is how you, you know, customize all of your stuff. And so we're hoping that the scene, um, you know, library is very much in the same kind of way where if you were a punk kid on MySpace, you could learn how to change your background color and change your mouse cursor because you could, you know, sort of look at the other examples. So in that kind of way, we're hoping that seam is approachable from that early, early stage. You know, not like other Web3 projects where you have to be a hardcore dev to like rebuild the whole sofa graph or all of that kind of stuff. Like you can learn from examples. Everything's there. Everything's open source. Um, so there's that with the documentation and the tutorial. So it really is hopefully aimed at that sort of like audience of learn from examples and sort of piece together. There is, though, the future side of things, right, where I think we're starting to see code being written a lot more easily, especially with sort of these other like AI driven chatbots and that kind of stuff. So you have GitHub Copilot, obviously GPT-4 just got released. And these, I know from my own personal development experience, I'm also the CTO, I write all of the code for Seam, uh, they have become invaluable in my development process. So I rely on them all the time now to help me out with bugs. And there's nothing to say that we couldn't say to say ChatGPT, hey, this is what a block looks like. You know, it's only three functions. It should be pretty straightforward. I mean, we're writing it so that someone who's 10 years old can figure it out. Uh, hopefully, this chatbot can also do that. So then you might be able to ask it in the future, make me a block that, you know, I can play chess versus a friend, or make me a block that uh, is a little countdown to my birthday, or, you know, make me a block that takes in a Spotify URL and then has a little music visualizer for my favorite song or something like that. Uh, and then we start to get a really fun era of the internet where you don't need to code, but you're just talking in natural language. And because the way that I've written the blocks is very like, you know, formulaic, it's fill in this one function, that's the render function that shows what's on the screen, fill in this other function, which is the edit modal. That's like how you get data into the block. That's it. That's all you need to do. Should be pretty straightforward for ChatGPT to start to figure it out in the near future. Wow. Okay. Well, I want to dig deeper into that soon, but before, how do people, how, how do users monetize? Because uh, you were saying that you can create blocks and then if I create a cool chess block, for example, with a chess game and other people, do other people buy that for me or like, do I sell it? Like how, how does that, how does that work? Yeah. So that's something we're sort of like constantly playing with and tweaking and figuring out because we sort of take the playbook, um, Jesse Walden's uh, sufficiently or uh, progressive decentralization. And so I think what needs to happen first is that people need to get really excited about building these blocks even before the sort of like financial side of things, because financial incentives can often um, mask product market fit and it can sort of act. There's a lot of sort of negative ramifications with like rent seeking and squatting and all these kinds of things where as soon as you introduce financial incentives, especially in a social setting, things can get kind of weird. So making sure that we sort of iron things out with uh, like seeing points. So right now, if you complete quests on our platform by just uploading a profile photo or something like that, you earn some points. And then very similarly, if you're a block developer, you know, you build this block because it's something that would help you and something that you're sort of just like excited to get out there in the world because a profile is also a place where you can just throw something up, no website, no anything. It's like one nice little self-hosted area for you. So if you're excited about that, then you get some points. And then that starts to then go from there. Very cool. Okay, so, you know, 10-year vision we'll call it for, for seem look like, like, are you guys going to be a, a notion mixed with a Facebook mixed with a, something else? Yeah, really. I mean, so customizable social spaces is kind of a mouthful, but really it just looks like the space between you and the people you care about is customizable. So rather than say like an iMessage thread, which just sort of exists in this ether and there's, you know, you can't really plug anything into that. If you're planning a trip, then there's a million and one different apps you can get on the app store for that, you know, we can actually start to configure these places contextually depending on how you care about this person. So when you and I first become um, friends on Seam, we can have a shared connection card and then we can start to drag in the blocks that matter to us. And so as our friendship morphs over time, 
you know, we can start to add and remove different kinds of information. And the privacy model there is very intuitive because it's very much like standing in a room with somebody and it's like, these are the things that I want to put into this room. So you start to think about social media actually reflecting our personalities, not as like monolithic entities, but actually as reflections of who we are in specific social situations. So one of the challenges that I had or that my team had when we were at Facebook is uh, something called context collapse. And so this is, in my opinion, the reason why people have stopped using Facebook so much. It's because the social graphs have gotten so large that there's so many different contexts. You've got your grandmother on there, you've got your friends, you've got your exes, you've got your bosses. It's like in order to find a piece of content that makes sense for all of those different people and social contexts, it doesn't make sense. And so it's just sort of melts down and that's called context collapse and sort of the we called it internally the audience problem. It's like, oh, you wouldn't post some revelry because that wouldn't that would then you would have the audience problem, right? And so as you start to think about what Seam can do differently, if we start to scale ourselves up to that size, to Facebook size, we won't have the audience problem. We won't have context collapse because each one of these cards can have context specific to the person and the groups that you care about because these blocks can be dragged in and out and have data that's only relevant for the people and areas that you want to share them with. Very cool. Do you have any kind of exciting news updates or anything that you want to share about Seam? Yeah, well, I can't say too much right now. Um, but so one of the areas that we're exploring quite heavily is the gaming side of things because, you know, it's just a personally a very interesting area to me. I was a competitive Overwatch player for a while. Um, when I was at Meta, I played on the team and was we had a game where the San Francisco Shock, which was the team of the area, the like pro team came and like spectated our game. And so I just, I love the competitive side of gaming. I also just love the friends and family side of gaming of like, that's how I keep in touch with all of my friends across, uh, across the country, all of my old college buddies and I. Uh, and so one of the things that scene profiles can really potentially bring to the world is this unified social layer where not only do you sort of have your friends on this graph, but you also then have these profiles that are, you know, customizable for the game itself. So rather than like, you know, you wouldn't in today's world, it's not farm bill anymore. You wouldn't link your Facebook profile to a game because there's like so much personal stuff on there and it doesn't again, context. Right. And so seem, well, what if you made a card that's for this game? And then what if you made a card for another game? And then like each one of these cards can be your profile in that area. You can start to have, different facets of your identity. Like my magic, the gathering persona is going to be different than my casual, like Minecraft server persona. Um, and so having seen be that layer that allows you to have these customizable profiles is something we're really excited about. So next week, fingers crossed is going to be sort of a big launch for us in terms of this arena. And we're going to start to create profiles for people in this pretty big web three game. So keep your eyes peeled on uh, CMXYZ on Twitter. We'll be doing some launches and giveaways for that. That's pretty exciting. That's awesome. Okay, so today's social media is very different from what you're kind of talking about. I mean, the hot thing is kind of these short form videos that are fed to you in an algorithmic manner. You know, how do you think about that world? If, if it's like, we're not even deciding anything anymore. And you're, cause you're talking about like, hey, you can come here, you can do stuff, you can curate, you can customize, you can do all these cool things. But like, you know, TikTok is like, I just sit there and it's like feeding me mm -hmm. videos, right? So how do you think about the, the future? Or do you think that there's always going to be this market for both? Yeah, I do think there's going to be a market for both. I mean, TikTok is a great example of sort of an entertainment company that is specialized in AI. I don't particularly think of them as a social platform. Oh, interesting. Um, and so I like to sort of distinguish these uh, into two separate groups. So there's, I think, social media, and there's also influencer media. And they have different um, audiences. They did have different, in, I mean, mind share in a lot of ways. Like, as TikTok usage has gone up in terms of time, Instagram usage, for example, has actually not been impacted. You would think that there would be, like, one-to-one. -one. If you're spending time on TikTok, you're not on Instagram. But it actually, for kids, like, 12 to 19, um, is just additive, surprisingly. Um, but so for, in, um, for, say, social media, those are your friends. Those are your family. Those are people you know in real life. And that has a different privacy expectation and different sharing expectation. But it's like my Instagram story, right? I'm just posting that. It's what I'm doing in the moment. It's what I'm interested in, all of that kind of stuff. And then the influencer media is different because that's public by default. That's Twitter. That's TikTok. That's the kind of area where I want to build an audience. I would like to go viral. 
I actually want as many people to see this content as possible. So very different privacy expectations. And the way that I consume it is also different because the way that I consume that content is based on being an influencer, following people that I aspire to be or am entertained by, as opposed to people that I, you know, on the social media side. So I think there's sort of this Venn diagram. Instagram sits nicely in the middle because like, obviously there are influencers on Instagram that you follow at the same time as you're also following your, you know, your friends, but there aren't that many platforms, Snapchat, social media, of course, TikTok, influencer media. Facebook, social media, although they try to get you to stay as long as possible by putting reels and they start to mix things together. But I really do think that if you start to think of it as these two different spheres, that will sort of be the way that social and influencer media diverge into the future. All right. So so how do you think about Web3? I feel like you have a very different view on Web3 as a whole compared to a lot of other people I speak with, at least. Just because in my realm, it's a lot of, you know, obviously we're investors, so it's very like finance oriented or like how to make money and like very within that world, you're looking at it problem solving arena and its capabilities versus just you like you ha haven't mentioned really anything about like number go up, right? Um, which is rare. So so I, I love to hear like your views on like web three, especially pertaining to like, solving problems that, that you're experiencing. Yeah, I mean, I really look at it through the lens of like, what are the new consumer behaviors that web three enables? because I love building the small apps. I was an iOS developer for my entire time that I was at Facebook. And so building the, we built a meme creation social platform, right? Like that's the kind of stuff that I love to do. You go to a college, you go to a high school, you're like, hey, you can make inside memes with your friends. Like, that's great. And so the question for me is like, okay, Web3, that's really fun. What does it actually enable? Um, and I sort of have two lenses to look at it. One is from the technological side, like I am an engineer, so I can audit these things. Like are the claims that people are making about this technology, do they live up to scrutiny? That's the first thing. And then the second thing is, okay, if they do live up to scrutiny, does anyone care because are they gonna make consumer products better? And so with those two lenses, like, are you telling the truth about what your technology can do? Okay, yes. Is it gonna matter? okay, yes, then I'm interested, right? And so that's the thread that we sort of like found through seeing. But I think, you know, maybe dispel some myths on Web3 social, because I hear a lot of people talking about things that I just do not think are true at all in terms of what the technology can sort of do for you. So I mean, I can go, go into that too, because like there are, there are some like myth busting, like Web3 social myth busting, if you will. Because I hear, I hear the term own your data. I hear that a lot. And that's one of the ones that sort of rubs me the wrong way the most. Because what does that really mean, right? So own your data. What does owning something mean? Let's just go back to that. Owning to me means I get control access to it. I can decide who gets to see it. And then I also get to sell it or remove it for myself if you want to, right? And so start to mix that with social media. So a blockchain, a blockchain is immutable, right? You can't delete anything from a blockchain. That's the whole purpose. Because if you could delete things, then people's money would just go away. And so, okay, you can't delete things on, on a blockchain. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've never used a social media platform where I haven't been able to delete something. Like, imagine all of your cringy posts from early Facebook or early MySpace, or I don't know what you were on, Andrew, <laughs> but uh, early social media. Very bad. Very, 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 it would be the, very the bad. The level of cringe would be immense. Right. And so I hear own your data, and I start to look at like, okay, if you put all social data on chain, for example... Do you really own it? Because you can never really delete it. it. It will always be associated to you at some point on chain. Even if you burn your NFT, it will still have in the transaction history that you had it at some point. And you can't also get access to it. So, you know, when I was at Facebook, the biggest scandal of the time was Cambridge Analytica. And that was because they found out a way to use um, quizzes to sort of find out your friend graph. It would be like, you know, Cambridge Analytica said, what horoscope are you? And you'd click through and add all your friends. And all of a sudden they got to piece together a social graph and they were able to use that for all kinds of various things. But in Web3 Social, we're just like, here's the whole social graph. Here's the whole fire hose of content. And I mean, that's immensely scrapable by advertisers and also by malicious actors. So if one of us becomes friends on one of these social platforms, like you have, everyone has access to that from negative actors to, you know, really anyone, if you ever break up with anybody, that's also publicly available. So own your data really, to me means everybody owns your data, like you too, but everybody. You know, I, I always hear the meme, like, for Web3 socials, like own your data is like the most important. But my, mine was going to be geared towards like, do people really care about owning your data? Because I would argue that they broadly don't. But then you, what you brought up is like way more, I guess, 
is way worse. You know, like I, I do not yeah, want, I it, want it is. social history forever uh, online to be scrapable by everybody. So I, I guess knowing that, how does that change the way your your building seem, if at all? Yeah, I mean, so we're doing centralized data storage with decentralized feature set. So we think the really cool thing is the creative attribution on chain but not the data storage. And that is a controversial take, you know, take in this world where, you know, potentially you would want to decentralize everything. But I think there's a lot of negative ramifications with putting all of that data on chain. Okay, makes sense. Back to the monetization quickly, because, you know, I think that Web3 is just incredible at monetization, like it's strong studios monetization, and, you know, selling tokens or selling NFTs and whatnot. But the ad driven business model is also like, pretty good. Like, uh, yeah, sure. It leads to like, whole bunch of societal issues and like, you know, depression and a whole bunch of other bad things. But overall, as like a business model, it's pretty stellar. So do you think that Web3 business models, specifically around Seam, like will be able to compete to a level that's equal or if not greater than the Adrian business model? Yeah, no, I definitely do. And I think there's two things here. One, it's an interesting point that you made about Web3 social, I mean, Web3 in general, just being like such a good monetization angle. Because another one of the myths that I want to bust is that like owning your own data means that you have some way to monetize it yourself, like through percentage of ads or something like that. And the only way that these sort of Web2 platforms are actually do so well is because of the number of users. So if we go back to like how much each platform makes, like on Reddit, it's 49 cents, right? Average revenue per user in the last financial quarter for Reddit was 49 cents. And so if you're like, okay, I own my own data and I got a fraction of a penny for that, it's like that, that doesn't quite make sense. So as you start to like separate these models, it's you've got the advertising model over here, which does well. You've got the Web3 model of like, you know, uh, NFTs and stuff, which does well. I would not mix the two because I think you're just not, there's just not enough money there, right, per user. So if you're thinking about Web3 social with advertising and then giving some of that advertising money back to users, I think that's sort of a non-starter just from economics. Um, but so from the scene side of things, I think the customization angle and the cosmetics angle that we can leverage from like free to play games, for example, is ultimately more lucrative than an advertising model. If you build a system where people are excited to partake, and especially if it's a system that their friends are able to build stuff for and have this sort of marketplace for, and then we only step back and say, take an open sea percentage, 2.5% or something like that of that. Because if your friend like releases a little new skin, like of course you're going to chip in and like you know help them out or something like that. Or if you have a large kind of organization that wants to put their scene page together and they need it to look a certain way, of course they're going to you know pay for that. And so there's a lot of different avenues from like theme NFTs to the block NFTs to individual handles. I mean, we haven't even talked yet about namespaces, which is sort of an interesting angle to. You know, you've got the Ethereum name system, you've got all of this different kind of ways that people are already starting to think about new ways to monetize social that have started to even trickle into Web2. Like it's gone back the other way where now you have Twitter blue and you can claim your YouTube handle now. And um, Telegram is another really interesting example where they're building the whole Ton blockchain and having a blockchain specifically for Telegram handles. And maybe that's the way that Telegram actually ends up becoming profitable because they don't want to sell ads, right? They don't want to do the Gmail thing of reading your messages and suggesting ads based on that. So, you know, there's, I think a lot of really smart people at the largest social company is already moving in this direction, which gives me even more confidence that it's going to beat up the ad-driven business model for both ethical, ethical reasons and profit-based reasons. So with the, with the name systems, for, for example... I mean, one of the things that I'm interested in is there's sort of this land grab that's happening now where everybody wants to put out a name system because that's one of the best ways to sort of, one, have some level of network effect because if I have a ENS, that means that I'm part of that ecosystem and it's easier for me to transact in there versus if I have a sole name or even nouns. Like nouns has a name system now. I'm, you know, the noun name system and it's because it starts to have that network effect. It has some of that defensibility. Um, one of the fundamental papers, I think, in this area is sort of the FAT protocol thesis. So this was um, Union Square Ventures in 2016 sort of presciently wrote that in Web2, there was the FAT application, right? Because you have things like Gmail that are built on top of open protocols like HTML, but it's the applications that take most of the value, right? Because you can build your new email client, and that's the thing that people use. But in Web3 and crypto, it's actually flipped where it's FAT protocol. 
And anyone who builds on top of Ethereum is actually strengthening all of Ethereum rather than their own individual application because applications can just, you know, there's no moat for them anymore because everyone has access to the database. So now it's a fat protocol. And as you're starting to look at Web3 Social or just other areas that are trying to get that network effect, you're also seeing fat protocol where if you're, say, DSO, you want everybody to be using the DSO token. And if you're an application that builds on top of DSO, well, I mean, someone else can just build another application and all of the users are interoperable and transferable by design. So they just flow away from you. So DSO ends up doing well. Whoever has the rails, the protocol does really well, but individual applications do not. And so that's changing the way that businesses are being built in sort of the Web3 arena. So uh, how do you think about gamification? Because you like gamification of the Seam application, because you were telling me early on that you're like, yeah, if you make a profile and you log in and whatnot, or you, know, you start creating stuff, you can get points, like Seam points. Do you think to, are you thinking to extend that? Like, I don't know, like badging systems or like reputation scores or, you know, like what, how, how, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, well, so there's two avenues here. One is the sort of identity system avenue, but I think first I'd like to touch on the gamification side of things. Um, Because at heart, I am a gamer. And so I love like a good track, you know, I'm grinding my way through the ladder of Magic the Gathering right now trying to get to the, you know, from diamonds to the next level, right? So I love that kind of stuff. The thing that we constantly have to be careful about, though, is not um, mixing incentives with social platforms. Because if you remember back to the days of like Farmville on Facebook, you would just get slammed with invitation requests from people. And Zanga as a company had the incentive to just you know, spew notifications to everyone. And like the gamification can sometimes come with a degradation of user experience. So at Seam, we're very, very careful about that, where these points and these quests and all of that kind of stuff should be very intentionally designed to have a better user experience, not just for the person who's earning the points, but also for everybody else inside of the ecosystem. So our initial quests are very simple. It's like upload a profile photo, get 10 points. And it's like, all right, that in an effect is just an extension of onboarding. Right. And it makes it better for everybody because we can see this is Andrew's NFT as opposed to just this is Andrew's default avatar. And so it just like makes the platform a little bit better. So that's the angle we're taking with um, with gamification. Okay, so what is the objective in your mind of social media? Because uh, on one hand, and you talked about like the different actual social media platforms is one being like influencer type one being actual more real like quote unquote social media is social media's purpose to entertain is it to actually help us form like relationships online is it to you know xyz in your mind like what is the purpose or uh, ideally um human connection and in short i think there's the influencer side of things that can sort of go live in the influencer media bucket but at the end of the day and the reason why i'm excited to keep working on it really is because in this world like All of my friends have sort of moved across the country to various areas. I grew up outside of Boston. I went to school in Chicago. I moved to SF for work. Now I'm in New York City. Like I've made little pockets of friends all over the place. And in our, I mean, distributed world in a lot of ways, the only way that I can stay in touch with people that I care about is through online platforms. And whether that's setting up a Minecraft server or, you know, creating Seam, which allows me to look at people's profiles and like, oh, they're listening to this song now. It's sort of those low touch kind of interactions that you get when you're living close with somebody, right? Like if I was in a room with my roommates, they'd be just watching a show. I could come in and be like, Oh, that's a fun show that you're looking at. But online, you sort of have to very consciously engineer those touch points. That it's not just always a check in conversation. It's sort of like an inspired by like, Oh, I saw you're doing such and such a thing. And I still love stories. Like I was on Facebook stories, I built Facebook stories. So I am biased. But I still think there's nothing better than seeing like someone skiing video and being like, oh my God, I'm actually at the same mountain right now. Of course, I never would have thought to reach out to you. But now that I know that you're here and I'm here, like, let's hang out. And so those kinds of magical moments, like serendipity, is really the, just the best part about social media, in my opinion, where you can sort of have these touch points and reconnection areas with people that you care about because of the serendipity of seeing something online or connecting with them through social media. Very cool. Awesome. All right. So th- this is a change a little bit from our social media conversation, but um, you mentioned before these AI tools like Copilot and whatnot, and how they're helping you, you code and can help other people code in the future. Tell me about that. Like, are, are these things, are, are they incredible? Like, are these tools am- am- amazing today? And 
how good will they get in the future? Because you mentioned like in the future, maybe I could go pop on a scene and be like, I want a block that does, you know, chess game and this, 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 this. Like, you know, how, how far away is that future, you think? Well, I can only speculate as a user of such products, not as like a developer of such products. Um, but I am amazed, honestly, in, in short, that GPT-3 just came out and then 4 has like just landed as of two days ago as a recording of this um, interview. But it's, I think the most impressive thing to me is the depth of conversation and also the context of conversation. So I will be debugging a front end bug. And so that means that something on my our Seam web page is not looking the right way, right? And I have tried everything that I know how to try. I copy and paste my code into GPT-3. I'm like, why is the div not centered? And it's like, this is why the div is not centered. And I'm saying, okay, but that centers it, but then moves the text somewhere random. And then it says, oh, that's because this. And we can actually sort of have a back and forth conversation that's very reminiscent to talking to like another engineer where they're not always going to know 100% like exactly what you want. And also me as an engineer, like I don't know exactly what's wrong. So I don't know what's like the best way to phrase the question, but through trial and error, through a conversation, we can actually come to an answer. And so it's solved like most of my bugs at this point. And so then if you extrapolate that into the future, it's like, okay, you can solve bugs really well right now. But what about creativity? What about moving into the arena, having it start to create things for you? And I'm always of the opinion that these kinds of things are net like pie and largers, like a rising tide raises all boats, right? Because this is just going to be another tool in our arsenal. It's basically like in terms of Web3 developers, I know for a fact there's like about 50,000 in the world right now, which is just absolutely nuts. But that's mostly because the bar of entry is so high where you have to learn, you have to go, like I did a, an engineering degree. I spent a lot of time doing that. I was also like at a fan company for five years. So like I'd spent a lot of time honing these skills. But if we can lower the barrier of entry using, you know, AI tools, all of a sudden we have such an influx of talent. And so that's really exciting because now we're empowering like a whole new generation of people and they're going to create companies and they're also going to create seam blocks. They're going to create new things um, because it's just going to become easier and easier. And that's net going to bring more opportunity. And I think we've sort of seen that same path in the past where tools have made things easier. So then, you know, the industrial revolution had a little bit of a dip where it's like, yeah, the cottage core kind of chair weaver person might not be doing so hot, but then, give it five to 10 years, all of a sudden, there's a lot more jobs and opportunity for things that there weren't before. Okay, so this is also kind of a weird macro question I have. But, you know, in a world where, as you mentioned before, I can like AI prompt this new block, right? But you extrapolate that out. And maybe I can like, say, hey, AI copy seam, and just like, maybe like make, make an entirely new seam. So in a world where the cost of creating, you know, software products, is minimal, like we're talking pennies or whatever, who wins? Who has the advantage? Who wins? Like, how, how do you survive in that? Yeah, I think it comes down to curation. And the, like, the, with the fire hose of content comes the value to the ability to pick value out of the noise. And in some ways, we sort of already have a content problem on, you know, certain kinds of uh, video platforms, for example where there's more hours of YouTube video than I could conceivably watch. There's more hours of TikTok video. And I'm sure that number will continue to go up as video becomes easier to produce, similarly with software. Um, but, I mean, there's no accounting for good taste, right? I think it's always been easy to do certain things, but good things are always hard to do. And it'll just make the kinds of things that we have access to, say, faster. Like, iteration speeds will go up for sure. You can definitely try something and see that it doesn't work and people don't care about it much faster, which will mean that it's easier to start companies, which I think is net good. But in general, the platforms or the areas which allow the most curation, you know, Seam is sort of the platform where you can build, design, and curate your perfect social spaces. The blocks that get used will be the ones that solve people's problems uh, or are the most fun. There will always be a top app in the App Store there will always be a front page of the New York Times. And so there will always be sort of like this rise of hopefully good content to the top. Um, but yeah, there's going to be a lot more curation to be done for sure. That's going to be a hard job is like weeding out. And this is already happening. Like Stack Overflow has blocked uh, GPT answers. Yeah, it's because they're just like of middling quality. And they're also like so quick because someone was writing a bot that would just scan the question, answer it, scan the question, answer it. Because there's some 
there's some clout, there's some identity in having like, you know, stack overflow points. So yeah, so then they, they banned answers that were ChatGPT. There's going to be sort of an arms race. So it's like, you know, on Reddit, you get your karma. I could, in theory, make a bot that says like the, you know, studies the, the top answers on Reddit, they, that, that it gets the most karma. And I could just get like a, a karma farming bot. Yeah. And so it's going to be sort of this arms race. And I saw this already inside of Facebook where, you know, you have nation states that are trying to break into Facebook. You have uh, actors that just want more clout, all of this kind of stuff. Uh, it's just going to be easier. And I think the craziest thing is going to be phishing schemes and, you know, deep fake videos and all of that, where the authenticity is going to get harder to prove, but then you're going to train models against the models that are proving the things. So then, you know, you'll say this one is verified fake, but then the fakes will get better. And then this one will have to be verified fake. Just sort of bring us back to Web3 identity, though. Because if you sign something with your private key and say, this is mine, then even if something else does like looks different, then you know there's only one verifiable copy. So in some ways, like direct ownership of things is coming just in the nick of time, just when we're going to have to like really secure ourselves against, you know, impersonations, for example. Totally. So, so are you thinking about keeping seam and it, obviously now it's like still early days. So it's hard to say with certainty today, but seem like are you keeping it uniquely human driven and human oriented because you, you know tiktok is very algorithmic ai driven and so it, it seems magic like the human touch or will that be its magic going forward yeah i think there's different ways to look at this um because for say profiles if you want a profile to be controlled by a bot or an ai or something and sort of have its self-expression reflected in some kind of way like i'm all for that you know, MySpace came about after Friendster and Friendster said no fakesters on this platform, only people who are verified. And so there's always a sinusoidal curve, you know, real people only. And then MySpace was like, if you want to be Homer Simpson, go for it. And then Facebook came and said, nope, you have to be, you know. And so now I think the pendulum swinging again. I'm happy for Seam to sort of have these, whether that's NFT avatars or VTubers or something like that. I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff going in that direction where you don't necessarily have to be like human fully in order to express yourself on a social platform. So there's that. And then with the curation side of things, that's still something we're definitely figuring out. That's awesome. All right, Nick, are you ready for the closing yeah. questions? Yes, I am ready. All righty. What are you bearish on? <laughs> Token prices. Token prices. Okay. T t yeah. t t tell me more. Tell me more. So I think, you know, tokens, I used to believe were reflections of value of, say, a particular community or ideology. I think over time, especially as I've dug more into the DAO ecosystem, the ability for any individual contributor to contribute enough value to meaningfully sway the prices is not as much as I would have hoped. So I love FWB. I think they're an excellent community, but my ability to contribute probably won't change like the token price. And so one of my initial theses in Web3 that I'm not sure holds up anymore is that the like assembling of value from tokens will allow these like really, really tight, cohesive communities. But I'm not sure they're just it's too correlated to the macro environment, right? Like you have SVB and then suddenly uh, token prices crash. They need to be insulated somehow. And I'm not sure what that is, but they need this like little walled garden. Cabin DAO is an excellent example where they decided like, actually, we're not going to have our tokens be open in the marketplace anymore because that doesn't reflect our values. It's hard to know who got in for the right reasons and all of that kind of stuff. All right. What are you bullish on? And obviously it cannot be seen. I think there's a lot of cool decentralized data storage stuff going on. So obviously I have my eye on ceramic, but the whole idea of like the D web is like the decentralized web. The Fediverse is also sort of what it's called, you know, that starts with things like Mastodon, but also um, Farcaster and all that kind of stuff. I always challenge it to think about how you can make the user experience better for such things. Like Mastodon, for example, there's a lot, I don't need to go into it right now, but there's a lot of challenges with like the actual user experience of it. But if there's some sort of thing like account extra, um, abstraction, for example, if account abstraction makes it so that, you know, you don't have to hook up your private wallet to all these sites to log in, then, you know, we're suddenly looking at potentially a more decentralized web. But so that's what I have my eye on. I'm hoping it's work, going to work out. Very cool. All right. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? I think it's probably from my dad. 
it's uh, don't let people rob you of your happiness. And it's just like a way to realize that you have a lot of agency in the world and your happiness is something that you hold yourself. And if someone can come along or an environmental thing or something, like you don't have to let them rob you of your happiness. You can keep it to yourself and sort of like remain solid in your own understanding and sense of self. That's awesome. All right, last question. What motivates you? Well, I think it's making the internet better every day. Like I love the tagline, remix the internet. Love that. Um, because it's just getting people back in it again, allowing them to customize things, giving the keys to the castle back to the people, um, making stuff that's really zany and self-expressive and just fun. Honestly, it's like every day that I see someone make a scene profile that's just like off the wall. I'm just so happy about it. That's amazing. All right, Nick, thank you so much for coming on. It, it, it was an absolute blast, and I will chat with you soon. Excellent. Thanks so much for having me, Andrew. See you. Right, take care.